Welcome back to the Autoblog Podcast. I'm Greg Migliori. We've got a great show for you this week. We are coming at you sort of live from CES. That's the Consumer Electronics Show. This is the 2024 edition. Uh, there's a lot going on out there. We're going to talk about the latest in-car technology and all the other stuff going on in the car world as it relates to CES. So with that, let's bring in uh, Associate Editor Byron Hurd, who is at the show in Vegas. How's it going, man? Hey, uh, it's going pretty good. I am literally on the on the showgrounds here, here at the uh, at the Westgate Hotel, which is where they're doing some of the CES events. And if you've never been here, this is a massive show. It's not just at any one place. It's at the Las Vegas, I'm sorry, the Las Vegas Convention Center. It's at the Mandalay Bay Convention Center. It's at a couple of other hotels and convention centers in town. There are shuttles that go between it. It is a massive, massive show with so much going on. And even just getting for the few things that we actually really care about, the car tech and the and the new AI stuff and the new autonomy stuff, stuff is it's overwhelming it's just a complete frenzy constantly and especially because today is actually the first day of the public show so it's not just media who are here we're surrounded by you know the general population if you will so it's very crowded it's very busy uh, but even yesterday during the press conferences on media day they actually had to shunt some of us into overflow rooms because it was so busy so the conferences are very heavily attended everyone's obviously really enthusiastic to be here so it's uh, it's quite an environment just if you're listening if this sounds a little like louder a little noisier than the typical auto blog podcast coming to you usually from like my sunroom and somebody else's like you know quiet living room uh, Byron is, you know, he's not on the actual floor, but he's right there at the convention center and just trying to bring that like flavor of the show and also get the podcast out this week with somebody who is at CES. Uh, we, we wanted to do it live. So not live, but on site. Let's put it that way. Sure. Yeah. Live to tape. Live to tape. There we go. There we go. So uh, I guess good place to start is Honda and then Honda slash Sony. Two of the big reveals so far. The Sony thing is just like an iteration of something kind of cool we saw prior, but the Honda stuff is actually kind of cool on its own. So why don't you talk about that? You are sort of embedded with the Honda, you know, news on this trip. So kind of tell everybody what's going on there. Sure. It's honestly like this is a big deal for Honda because over the past couple of years, we've seen a lot of announcements from them on what they plan to do regarding electrification because the Japanese automakers have just kind of been behind on it, with the exception of Nissan, although they've sort of squandered their lead with the Leaf. But this is essentially another reboot of Honda's electric strategy. They want them to be smaller, lighter EVs. They want cars that are fun and engaging to drive. They want it to be driver focused, which is something we don't hear a lot from EV tech, from all the new autonomous stuff we're seeing. It's not about the driver. It's not about the driving experience. It's about being comfortable and coddled and entertained. So it's nice to see something from Honda where they're pushing for something that will actually engage with the driver. So they're talking about like posture control for the saloon, which is a wild Lamborghini looking four door, which is crazy enough, the car they intend to build versus the hub, hub space, which is an interesting like crossover looking thing, but still leans a little into the kind of fantastical. You've got the lounge seating arrangements and stuff like that, and kind of a hint that maybe it's gonna be a little more of an autonomous car, but we could also see it kind of developing into a new Honda Odyssey. It's kind of got the same DNA as the prototypical MPVs that really kind of gave birth to minivans as we know them. So that's a really interesting concept, but it's the saloon with the crazy Lambo doors and all that kind of stuff that really got our attention. It's got retro vibes, looks ridiculous. It's supposed to be fun to drive. So we're really looking forward to that. And they're going to sell it in North America. In fact, this will be a North America first product starting in 2026. And, you know, we know Honda. Honda loves to make quote unquote concept cars that actually end up being the production car pretty much in a very thin disguise. So while this is a really wild concept and I'm sure there will be elements of it that don't make it to production, what we're looking at should actually be pretty close to what they end up building, which is exciting on multiple levels. I mean, it's a cool looking car. It's a cool driver's car, at least potentially, obviously we haven't driven it yet. So it's something to get excited about in a world of autonomy and EVs. 
in a way that I don't think anybody's really tapped into since Tesla did the original Roadster. It's not, you know, it, it there is a new Roadster coming in theory, but there's a chance Honda beats in the market with a more interesting and fun car that's really designed for the masses. So we're excited about these um, thin battery packs, lightweight chassis, all about efficiency and fun. Um, that's what we've been waiting for automakers to tell us about. And they actually pointed out in the Honda press conference that other manufacturers were kind of leaning into the weight and the girth of EVs and just being like, well, we can make big, bad trucks and big, bad SUVs. And I have to kind of wonder if maybe that was maybe a little kind of parting shot at GM, because I don't know how that relationship ended. But you figure they're, you know, talking about like other manufacturers making great big EVs and, you know, GMC, or GMC has the Hummer EV pickup and SUV and Cadillac's got the Escalade IQ coming so it's you know I don't want to start drama or anything like that but it makes you wonder like you know if maybe there was more to their split than just Ultium supply issues maybe Honda actually had a philosophical approach to their car manufacturing that GM couldn't really vibe with and while like the prologue and the blazer is kind of a place where they can meet in the middle I think their trajectories diverge beyond that so it'll be interesting to see how much of this comes to production, how soon we see the SUV or crossover car, the hub space, transform into something a little more production ready. But it really shouldn't take that long. I mean, if they're on a timeline here that puts the, the saloon, as they're calling it, the sedan, into production by 2026, then they don't have a whole lot of time to get this all fleshed out. So the news should come pretty fast at this point. And I'm betting that by the end of the year, we'll know more about their plans. Yeah, I, I'm really excited about this. Looking at this, you know, the, the concepts we've seen at the show, both of them look really cool. They both have sort of separate missions. And I think, you know, the way you kind of contextualize their sort of breakup with General Motors, that makes that whole situation make more sense. Because when you look at what Honda is looking at doing, it's, it's definitely different than how it would have been if they had used more of an Ultium, which is GM's sort of battery you know solution for evs it's a lot different so i think and i think that's probably good for both companies you know i always wondered frankly why gm was doing this it seemed like they were giving away their proprietary technology yes you can scale yes it makes more financial sense probably to get more vehicles off of this technology but it also kind of seemed like why are you guys doing this and then from honda's perspective clearly they're a huge company. They have the R and D muscle to do it. Why wouldn't you do it? Like this to me looks like what they should have been doing all along. Yes, I agree. And it's interesting. So you look at what Honda showed by itself and then we'll segue into the Sony Honda mobility, which isn't really associated with Honda in any way. I mean, their name is on it and they obviously have program engineers involved in it. But like when you talk to Honda's communications people, they're like, we know nothing about it, we do nothing with it. And it's kind of another sort of fork off this same like EV pathway that they're going down because you've got Honda, which is saying, we're gonna build cars that have advanced driver safety systems and semi-autonomous features and things like that, but we don't just want these to be self-driving cars. Meanwhile, Sony Honda Mobility is saying, well, we'll give you a car that will drive you where you want to go, entertain you on the way, create an experience for you as a passenger, whether it's your car or not. So this is, you know, kind of letting Honda do the fun stuff while Sony Honda Mobility does the more practical, I don't want to use, I don't want to say like appliance minded stuff, but the more everyday, the, the kind of like, eh, I can't think of the right word to describe what, but you know, the mundane seems negative. All of these, like all the terms that are, that are coming to mind for me sound pejorative and they're not meant to be that way because there's a place for both of these ideas. I mean, there are plenty of people out there who don't care about driving and want a nice comfortable car that gets them there. That's perfectly fine. But Honda says, we can do that without it being ours by getting Sony involved. I feel like we all win. Like that way Honda can still do what Honda's good at. Sony, which is an electronics and software giant can do what it's good at and everybody ends up happy. So this, this seems like an interesting approach. The only real downside right now is we don't know a whole lot about Afila. This car exists, we've seen it twice. Now it's got production-ish mirrors, but really nothing's changed since we saw it last year. So. 
it's you know they're talking up AI, they're talking up the tech that's gone into it, but you can't see any of that until there's actually a car to drive. So, you know, at this point we're just kind of twiddling our thumbs, and waiting to see what comes of it. But I think you know, they're shooting for end of the decade for this versus you know two to three years for the Honda stuff. So we'll see Honda's more engaging vehicles before we'll see anything that comes out of this, especially since Honda's already said that North America will be the first market for this new Zero Series. It's To me, it's really interesting, just like with the Honda slash GM venture is the Honda slash Sony venture. To me, that is, uh, you know, you probably remember 10 years ago when we were talking about like the Apple car, there were rumors of Sony, Google was involved in some like thing with wheels that was going to be part of a car. And to me, Sony is not the partner that I would have thought was left standing in this whole kind of like merry-go-round of, you know, tech companies trying to get into the automotive space. So this is really interesting. I think it's almost like could be a sleeper surprise, uh, you know, of perhaps a new player in, you know, the automotive space. And I think, you know, to your point, by the end of the decade, if they could build something like this and market it like this, I think there's a ton of people that would say, whoa, Sony did a car? I've heard of Sony. Okay. It's a lot different than, say, Fisker or Lucid or even Rivian. You know, uh, Everybody in the world knows what Sony is. So yeah. I'm really intrigued. And they, again, they haven't really laid out their business case in any way. So we don't know, you know what this is going to be. But I, I'm really intrigued by this. So we'll see. Yeah. It looks very interesting and kind of segueing off of that, we just got an announcement from Google yeah. that they are going to be able to integrate with existing EV platforms so that you can get mileage and range information directly from your car into the Google Android automotive ecosystem, which might actually extend all the way to Android Auto, which is not the same as Android Automotive because these things need to be this confusing, I suppose. But it's a very interesting announcement we see this right now because it comes right after GM's announcement that they're getting off of external phone integration platforms to do their own because they want to own the data, they want to own all the stuff that's going on. And this was one of the things they cited. It was like, well, you know, the, Google's technology can't integrate directly with our systems, so we'd rather go away from them and develop our own. And Google's just like, oh, yeah, actually, we can. There it is. So I feel like this is, you know, Again, another maybe dig at GM, <laughs> but at the same time, like they, you know, their dance card's been wild this year, so there's going to be some fallout one way or the other. Yeah. So, so let's kind of look at some of the other things we saw at the show or you've specifically seen. Uh, it's a good time to plug right now all of our CES coverage. Uh, by the time you're listening to this, uh, we will we'll have wrapped up our live blog, but that's worth a read if you want to go back and check that out and just see. Uh, obviously, it was the big things we covered, but also just interesting things, you know, that maybe you missed stuff that we saw, like a press release or a tweet come over. Uh, our senior editor for all things consumer, Jeremy Korsniewski, quarterbacked that one, and he definitely quarterbacked that, getting a lot of different things in there that were pretty good, uh, things you might have missed. So check that out. Uh, at some point, either by the time you're listening to this or perhaps early Monday morning, we'll have our awards from the show, break it down. We rank the reveals, that type of thing. Uh, so definitely come back to the site for all of your like all things automotive. You know, our friends at Engadget and TechCrunch, other Yahoo sites, they can tell you about the phone and TV you want to buy. But, you know, we have the car things covered. Uh, what else, though? Kia did a lot of stuff there. Yeah. That was interesting, like several different versions of this concept. Concepts are cool. It's CES, apparently. We don't see concept cars anywhere else, but CES is still charging up that hill. So what, you know, what did you think of the Kia display? Honestly, uh, that ended up being way cooler than I actually expected. That's to. I, I read over the materials ahead of time, kind of knew what I was getting into. Um, so it was really like the announcement of the production PV5, which is the front wheel drive kind of middle of their little lineup idea for a multi-purpose electric van on a new skateboard chassis. It's designed to be highly flexible, highly versatile, essentially create an entire ecosystem of little electric transport vehicles that will eventually all be integrated by an autonomous network. And it's really cool because you know, the idea is, you know, okay, it can be a passenger car, it can be an RV, you know, just kind of like a typical delivery van kind of set up, like you can do a 
sprinter RV or a Ram RV, you know, same kind of deal. But the way they have them all integrated and how nicely they all work together, I, I made a joke in the live blog that was kind of a human centipede, which is a very vulgar way of looking at it. But like you can literally like connect them to each other to offload cargo between them. And the little ones, the little runabout, the PV1 is tiny, has four wheel like full uh, 90 degrees steering so you can literally just like spin in place so you know you could maneuver it in very tight spaces move it in and out of parking spots you could probably fit four maybe six of them into like a really large parking lot because they all have a rear egress door so even if you park in you actually can still get in and out because you just stand up and walk right out the back. You don't have to climb over a row of seats or anything like that. So there's a lot of interesting stuff that they're doing with it. It looks like the kind of thing that might actually end up being more suited to like a massive factory operation than necessarily consumer stuff. But for logistics companies, this is great because you have, you know, one platform, one size for each. You know, it's, it's The joke is that it's purpose built vehicles, right? Which is not what PBV actually stands for, but that's what they are. You can have five different cars that all use the same tech. They're all different sizes. All their parts are interchangeable. All of the engineering is interchangeable. So whatever you need, and if you need to change from, say, a van to a pickup, you can even do that. They, they say you can change the back half, quote unquote, in the field, meaning with tools at your site. So that's fancy. I mean, obviously you're gonna need something that can lift even a composite body off the back of an electric car frame. It's not like you can do it with your hands. You'll need a crane or something. But the idea is that the end customer will be able to further refine their idea of what these things can be based on the needs that they have and what they need to do going forward. So, you know, you could buy it as a pickup, but use it as a van and sell it as a pick. Like there's so many different options with it and they're just cool looking. You got the little, you know, the little electric signs on the front and the, you know, they just, it was, it's it's kind of cute. It's also a practical and interesting idea and a new take on the delivery segment that kind of coalesces all the other ideas we've seen before, adds the EV element, says, all right, we can do this as an ecosystem. So it's pretty impressive. Yeah, you know, I, I give Kia credit. Over the years, they've uh, rolled out interesting concepts at, I mean, almost every auto show. They used to use the Chicago Auto Show as sort of like their like kick kickoff tent pole, you know, place they would show kind of a very interesting, you know, design study. And uh, I, I applaud them for kind of bringing this different way of thinking to CES. These things are interesting. And uh, they also seem to have somewhat of a business case behind them. You know, like it makes sense how they could change their product portfolio when you look at the way they're, they're rolling these things out. They're not just crazy concepts. Like there's a rationale behind them, which I think is kind of neat. Yeah, and it integrates a lot of the little like, small things that we've seen coming out of the greater like Hyundai group with like the in-wheel motors and the, the steering and all those kinds of things that are just like we've seen bits and pieces of it here and there and we've we've had them kind of suggest conceptually how they might work but this is one of the first times where we've seen like all of those showcased in a single lineup in a way where it's like ah this this comes together this 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 makes sense as a whole so pretty promising all right let's talk a little bit about uh, some of the Mercedes stuff we've seen come out uh, uh, Mercedes and to a lesser extent BMW this year have, you know, had some good stuff at the at CES. Uh, Volkswagen in years past has uh, made a big deal about it. This year, not so much, although they are doing chat GPT and Volkswagens. I guess we should touch on that and we'll see how that goes. But Mercedes showed some, I thought, interesting stuff here. You know, the the new MBOS infotainment. Uh, naturally, there's AI involved in that, of course. I think AI is sort of another... I wouldn't say underlying, it's an over, overt theme of the show. Uh, new MBUX, which is kind of cool. If you want to play Beethoven, you can compose a song while you're driving, which don't we already do that? You know, every song is, you know, you kind of add your own words to it. You know, Tiny Dancer from Elton John usually becomes Tony Danza or something. Uh, so the car will let you do it. Uh, I don't know, what'd you think of the Mercedes stuff? I, I think this is kind of neat. Uh, you yeah, know, there's even some Dolby Atmos stuff, which a version of that won our tech of the year last year. Yeah. 
Yeah. Well, it's cool to see. I mean, the, we kind of we generally like Mbox. It, it has its issues mostly with the like the physical interface, but if you use the voice control and the like, what is now going to be the AI enabled aspects of it, which I think there's actually already already some low level AI involved in their in their voice system. But the idea is that you know they're they're finally finding new ways to actually make this interesting. Finally, and I mean, the, the fact of the matter is that Mercedes builds a gorgeous infotainment system. The screens are always pretty. Even the even the basic ones look great. The functionality is usually there. Sometimes you have to dig too far to find it. And so the more they lean into voice activation, AI-based stuff where you don't have to think about it, you just ask the car to do what you want, the better off they are. Because it just, you know, it, it's wonderful you can literally just say, hey, Mercedes, do this thing. And it, it does it. You don't have to think, you don't have to search, you don't have to poke around, or, you know, seek out the option you want, you just ask for it. And the more they lean into it, the better. Um, and it'll be interesting to see, like, what the production version of this looks like. <laughs> they, uh, it, uh, theoretically, this is it, but we just need an actual production car to try it in. And at the moment, there is one. So, yeah, I, I think that's to a certain extent. Sometimes that's how CES feels like, is you have these, you know, technologies where they're like they sort of exist as like, you know, you see a lot of cockpits, a lot of like instrument panels, a lot of screens, of course, and you're like, what's the actual application here but mercedes has a pretty good track record of actually getting these things into cars usually at some point it might take them a decade but they're also usually quicker than most so yeah. well and speaking of big flashy things that we've seen here this is strictly automotive related we saw the new mullen r5s i believe that's the, the s yeah. yeah it's anyway it, it sounds like an rs5 it sounds like an audi knockoff but it's not it's basically looks like an electric charger and it's got a thousand horsepower wow. And it's going to be three hundred thousand dollars, they say. And so, you know, this, Mullins is the company that bought Bollinger. Like they are, they're they're hardcore into like the heavier duty EV stuff. The consumer stuff is kind of like their their side hobby. So, it's, you know, we're looking at this thing that that really literally looks like it. Dodge was like, hey, let's just make our current charger electric. It's exactly what the Mullen looks like. It's pretty cool looking, to be perfectly honest. But they're asking three hundred thousand dollars for this thing, so it's going to have to perform. <laughs> above and beyond and that's not even the most expensive version the most expensive version is three hundred and eighty five thousand dollars so as you can imagine you know you can have the, the touring version the sport version of this new crossover that they're calling it really looks a lot more like kind of a high riding sedan maybe along the lines of like a polestar or a toyota crown something like that like it's just a big substantial machine with a real big battery and some real big motors that can go real freaking fast and they even have a mode that since it's a, the rs they're calling it track stars because the last two letters are rs so that's like the track mode in the car and you put it in that it unlocks all the power and it you know lets you have fun with it and they had quite a presentation they had actors there playing ben franklin and fairy porsche and henry ford and nikolai tesla all like marveling at this this electric thing that 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 Mullen has created it was quite over the top and i guess to punish them for that the uh driver's side door mirror fell off in the middle of the presentation so for two hundred ninety five thousand dollars, i hope the mirror stays on but uh apart from that i think we just have to wait and see on this one it seems a little a little pie in the sky and as much as we've always liked bollinger and from what we've seen of Mullen, it looks like they're they're making promising inroads into heavy duty this is definitely more kind of like, as you were saying, leaning toward vaporware until, you know, they're actually selling them to customers, real customers. That's when it actually counts, right? So it's an interesting thing, a cool looking thing. We've got some pictures of it up. Feel free to check those out. It's maybe my favorite design of the show so far. Uh, not my favorite, you know, show, but definitely my favorite design. It looks cool. Can't deny that. Just uh, want to see if it holds together until the dull of the day when it's actually real. Yeah. No, that's interesting. Just looking at the, the pictures of this thing, it's it's pretty wild. I applaud that press conference. That is like, that's like Chrysler at the, you know, peak Lee Iacocca, Bob Lutz, you know, back when Detroit was the king of auto shows. That's impressive. Although I guess you can only, you know, parody so many dead people the karma coming back to get you. And apparently one of those guys didn't like it and boom, the mirror fell off. <laughs> right. So. Yeah, that was that was quite something. Well, and, and that press conference actually had a seizure warning beforehand. So, oh, you know, okay. like they were they were really telling you, like, we're going to 
we're gonna mess with you a little bit and they did so it was it was an entertaining show uh the cars got potential but uh we'll, you know one of those we're definitely playing wait and see do we have any more guidance on what's up with like mullen and ergo by extension whatever bollinger i'm curious because remember they're like off-roaders really took like our audience by storm like six seven years ago they looked like you know modern day defenders they looked frankly closer to what people thought the defenders should be you, you picking up any intel on that from the floor what's going on there yeah well they they've got them on the floor yeah. the the bollinger trucks are there uh the bollinger people are there with the mullen people mm -hmm. i mean it's you know it's the same crowd now yeah um but yeah they were they they talked up bollinger during the press conference actually they were you know very excited about delivering customer trucks which is essentially what the mullen takeover allowed yeah. is bollinger was steaming ahead until COVID hit and that really just kind of took their legs out from under them because they were they were ready to deliver some some prototypes and uh, and production of everything shut down. All supply chain shut down. It was literally like March of that year. They were so close. And the course that that company would have taken vanished in an instant there. So when Mullen came along, it was kind of an angel investment for them. It was like it was that that shot in the arm they needed to get back in the game to say, hey, yeah, we can actually build customer trucks. Because before they said, no, we're, we're, we're backing off. We're going just with the commercial side. We're not going to do anything consumer. We can't afford it. We've got to we've got to narrow our scope. We can't do the, the B1, B2 the way we planned it before. Now they're back in business. Now it's the consumer trucks are back on. You know, we can actually buy one of these just to drive. It's not, you know, it doesn't have to be a heavy duty thing anymore. So it's it's happening again so we're basically we've gotten back to like say maybe like february of 2020 on the bulge wow. timeline it feels like to me so it's it's real again and they're and they're back off and running well that'd be an interesting place to go february of 2020 when we perhaps all like to go there and you know turn back time yeah tell us tell some people something yeah maybe yeah. maybe invest some money in a few places there you go that, that would be a different <laughs> world uh, i'm gonna buy a lot of stock in zoom and then try to sell it by 2021 uh there you go we'll see yeah, no, that's really, I think that's cool. I, um, you know, I, they could be the kind of EV company that sort of cuts through the clutter. Uh, granted, they're in a smaller scale, you know, so we'll, that'll be a very interesting turn point. So what's the feel of the show? What, what do you think? Is it? Uh, yeah. it's, it's busy. It's crowded. It's very high energy. I mean, we're, it reminds me of the, the the days of the Detroit Auto Show back when I first started in the business. Wow. Like, you know, the, the late aughts. And, you know, you, you were still shoulder to shoulder and standing room only at most of the press conferences. And if you weren't an hour and a half early, you didn't get a seat. It's just like that here. Um, I was like the third person through the door. It felt like half the time. And yet every seat was already taken. So it's, it's busy. Everyone's here. Eyes are on it. Um, and I think... Honestly, it's it certainly feels like a bigger show than last year. Like there's, there's just more here automotively than there was last year. But at the same time, it feels a little off because you know last year we had Stellantis and the and the Ram unveiling and all of that. Like we had some real domestic powerhouse stuff here. This year it's Honda, 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 Kia, Hyundai. That's it. Like it's you know everything else is pretty noise level. So you know Mercedes is here with. UI stuff with, with cabin stuff, you know. Hyundai actually, I mean, Hyundai didn't show us a car. They just told us they're definitely going to do hydrogen, which that is what it is. That's big news, you know, for their logistics side, for their business side, not so much for us as car enthusiasts. Like, yeah, sure, they actually deliver a, a nice updated Nexo next year. We'll look at it, we'll enjoy it, but it's just not something that an average American can live with because hydrogen infrastructure just doesn't exist so that's what they want to work on they want to move toward that they're seeing it as like a you know a two path system they have battery electric on one side and they have fuel cell electric on the other and you just weave them together where it's appropriate and let them be separate where it's not and i think really what that means is you know commercial real heavy duty shipping that kind of thing leans toward fuel cell where all the consumer stuff stays EV for the most part which is really what kind of have been saying for years it's like that's what really makes the most sense for hydrogen because you know, for commercial traffic you can keep that near hydrogen fueling stations use them as hubs things like that it keeps all of that stuff kind of away from the consumer angle where you know like there's not a whole lot of advantage to fuel cells over electric right now except for range and that is going away quickly so the VinFast pickup kind of cropped up onto my radar a little bit late. I think it's called the VF Wild, which is yes. quite the name. Um, 
you know, some of the, you know, they have very ambitious plans of, you know, a very wide projected portfolio, if you will. So I think, you know, we'll see. I'm a truck, I think, is an interesting play. It it looks pretty good. I don't know if you've had a chance to make your way over to that part on the floor. Um, but it's, I mean, frankly, I think getting into trucks right now, especially when you have funding, like, you know, their parent company has plenty of money. It's the right play. You know, you're not betting on some niche that may or may not pan out. Like, you know, putting your money on trucks is a good move. So, yeah. Yeah, yeah I agree. No, I have not made my way over to the VinFast uh, setup yet. Uh, James Riswick was over there during the unveiling, so he got some pictures of that. And uh, I'm looking forward to checking it out because that truck, it looked pretty cool. And that, that one little teaser that they snuck out like a month ago, it, it was hiding in the background behind one of, I think it was actually behind the VF3, which they also showed today. So they, they kind of teased it, but didn't really tease it. So I'm looking forward to seeing it in person. Sounds good. Sounds good. How much have you hung out with Rizwick? So yeah, <laughs> we uh, he he arrived late last night, just in time to be here for Sony Honda, and uh, got to watch that with me. Um, and we kind of bounced off of each other a couple times on the floor today. But it's been so busy that we really have not had a chance to interact. So it's uh, it's 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 packed in here, and we've been on the move pretty much constantly. So a couple more hours of this, and we'll be done. But uh, we're still going strong. All right. Well, that is CES 2024. Uh, kind of a special episode of the Autoblog podcast, special in the fact that, hey, it's CES focused. I think kind of a cool way to kick off the year. Special and also, hey, it's it's on site. So, uh, you know, hey, shoot us, uh, shoot us an email. Let us know if you kind of like the on site format. So that's podcast at autoblog.com. Um, if you have some spend my monies, send them over. We'd love to hear from you. If you enjoy the show, five stars on Apple Podcasts, Spotify. Wherever you get your podcasts, uh, be safe out there. Have fun over there in Vegas. Uh, you know, Byron, don't call on any inside straights, uh, <laughs> if you will. And uh, we'll see you when you get back. Sounds good. All right. <laughs>